who will give you an overview on how to study them. There are 12 pairs, and they emerge off the base of the brain. Emerge from base of brain, brain stem. Okay, and um, from this figure, maybe hard to see. You need to know that there's a name and a number for each cranial nerve, so you're required to know both. Study, name, and number. We'll go through all of them, but for example, the first one is cranial nerve 1, CN1 and his name is olfactory nerve. So know the name and number. Be able to identify it on the base of the brain. Okay, ID, no path. For example, cranial nerve one is right there on the cerebrum. We'll go through all 12. But also know that I'll teach the functions. You're required to know the functions of each nerve. It's either going to be sensory, motor, or both. Sensory, motor, or both. And of course, there's visceral sensory, and well, I'll, I'll go through each individual one. Basically, sensory, motor, or both. For example, the olfactory nerve, I say it smells. That's a sense. And it's strictly sensory. It doesn't have any other function besides that sensory function of smell. Oh, let me pass the slide. Another way to study them is um, where they exit the skull. Cranial nerves, if they're, they're going to get to where they need to go, they have to leave the skull. So the picture on the right, you're looking at the cranial base of the skull, superior view. And that's a good way to kind of study where they exit. study where the nerve exits. Uh, so for example, let me um, get a skull. It's a good exercise to do when you're in the lab and you're studying, you're trying to memorize where they exit. Um, just get a skull, get a pointer, and then go through 1 to 12, because that's how they're numbered. Um, cranial nerve 1, olfactory, exits through the olfactory foramen of cribriform plate. Cranial nerve 2, optic nerve, oh, exits through optic canal. Cranial nerve 3, ocular motor, that exits superior orbital fissure. Uh, four is trochlear, also exits superior orbital fissure. Cranial nerve five, it has three branches. The first branch, ophthalmic, exits through superior orbital fissure. V2, uh, maxillary, exits through foramen rotundum. And V3, mandibular, exits through foramen ovale. Six is abducens, it also exits through superior orbital fissure. Seven is facial, exits internal acoustic meatus. And so is eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve exits through internal acoustic meatus. Cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal, exits through uh, jugular foramen. Ten, vagus, exits through jugular foramen. Eleven, um, spinal accessory nerve exits through jugular foramen. And twelve, is hypoglossal nerve exits through hypoglossal canal. So memorize name, number, and where they exit. For starters, we'll just use a skull to help um, 
you identify all those foramen. That's why I teach the foramen of the skull. You have to know for the cranial nerves anyway. Another thing to notice is the number is 1 to 12 from front to back. Here's number 1. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, 9 and 10 are here. Or here's 11 and there's 12. So it goes from front to back. They're just numbered. So it's easy to count to 12, but you also have to memorize the name. So 12 cranial nerves, I used to always start with number one. And here's a picture of where they exit. So it exits the olfactory foramina in the cribriform plate. <coughs> now that plate is in the ethmoid. And um, when those little fibers exit, they're actually coming off of a structure called the olfactory bulb. <coughs> so if you follow it backwards, these little fibers here, they're called olfactory fibers, but they come off the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is after the olfactory tract, okay? So going forward, it goes olfactory tract, olfactory bulb, and it's actually the olfactory fibers that exit. So I want you to distinguish between those three. Olfactory, tract, then the bulb, then olfactory fibers exit. that order, okay? And um, if you kind of look to see where they exit to, there's a little epithelial layer that's responsible for catching odor molecules. So here's a um, picture of their function. And you can see the bulb on top, and they even show you the cellular structure in the bulb. But these little <coughs> holes here are the uh, filaments of the olfactory nerve. I call them fibers. They're exiting the little holes of the cribriform plate and Basically, here's where they end up. You have an olfactory sensory neuron. And notice it's a bipolar design. So I'm writing, factory, um, olfactory sensory neurons are bipolar. And they're within this structure called olfactory epithelium. Olfactory epithelium. The olfactory epithelium, of course, contains olfactory sensory neurons, but you need, need supportive cells for the neurons. So they simply call them supporting cells. And there's also mucus glands, or they call them olfactory glands. But notice the epithelium has a mucus layer to catch the odor molecules. That's the route of inhaled odor molecules. And when they get caught in the mucus layer, that triggers a signal 
back to the brain, going up through um, the structures we just listed. So the olfactory epithelium also contains supportive cells and olfactory glands. So odor is our molecules that are airborne that get stuck in your olfactory epithelium to trigger the sense of smell, one of the special senses. That's cranial nerve one. Purely sensory, okay? So I'll put an S for sensory. Also, cranial nerve two, it, it's, two is purely sensory, it's for vision, optic nerve. special sense of vision is carried by the optic nerve. So I'm going to show you a picture of the sphenoid bone in and out of the skull here to remind you of, well, I'm pointing to the optic canal of the sphenoid bone because that's where this nerve exits. to find that one on the skull. There's a picture of um, it in the eyeball. You can see the optic nerve basically enters the back of the eyeball in this picture. Okay. The optic nerve is right here. However, if you follow it backwards, uh, the signals get crossed at the optic chiasm. And after the optic chiasm where they cross, you get the optic track. Okay. So, For the optic nerve, you got one for each eyeball, left and right. You know that each optic nerve carries sensory infor information for visual, uh, from both visual fields, right and left. Each optic nerve carries info from both visual fields, right and left. Um, this information crosses at the optic track. So distinguish optic nerve from I'm sorry, the signals cross at the optic chiasm. So distinguish optic nerve from optic chiasm, where the optic nerves cross. So I'll just say info crosses. Info from right to left visual fields is going to cross at the optic chiasm. Then after that, color pink is the optic track. need to know about that is after the information crosses at the chiasm, um, each optic track carries information only from left or right visual fields, not both. Each track carries info from only right or left visual fields.
just write down these definitions for now, and I'll, I'll I have a figure that kind of illustrates that later. I showed it to you before when I showed you Mr. Split Brain. Remember that? So re-examine that figure, and we'll look at it again. And um, optic nerve, let's distinguish that from the chiasm in the tract. So more eyeball nerves, three, four, we'll skip five for now and um, come back to it. But six, three, four, and six. Ocular motor nerve, trochlear nerve, abducens nerve, all innervate uh, muscles of the eyeball, and one other things. So basically, there's the eyeball dissected from a front view in the eye orbit. This previous picture is from a side view, and you can see that the sclera, the whites of your eyes, are an insertion for what are called the, the extraocular eye muscles. Okay? The muscles that move your eyeball. So moving your eye is not a sensory function, right? That's a motor function. Ocular muscles, just think of them as muscles that move the eye, your eyeball muscles. So if you want to talk about it in terms of neural fit, is that somatic motor function, skeletal muscle, voluntary movement. So these are motor nerves, and um, this next picture, I just kind of have them numbered. And let's just kind of name the muscles. Number one, just follow me here, number one's up there, this muscle on top. That's the superior rectus muscle. I'll just put superior rectus. Number two, on the inside. Medially. Medial rectus. Number three. It's on the bottom there. That's inferior rectus. Number four. It's inferior, it kind of inserts at an oblique angle. It's called the inferior oblique. Number five, it's up here. This muscle's kind of special. It has a little pulley. Okay, notice that. So the muscle here, the tendon goes through a pulley, and it's going to insert in this area, although you really can't see it. Anyways, the name of the muscle is superior oblique. Number six, muscle on the side, laterally. Uh, lateral rectus. So you should also note um, the nerves that innervate these muscles. I'll just give you the number for now. We'll write them out later. Uh, okay. This one, lateral rectus, I'll start with the one I just mentioned, is cranial nerve <coughs> 6. The one that runs through a Holy superior oblique that's innervated by the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four. All the other ones are three, oculomotor.
So the name for cranial nerve three is oculomotor. So it's just it's the same for the first four. The name for cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve. Because it runs through a pulley, a trochlea, you know. Um, so that's how it, it's got its name. The muscle runs through a, a pulley. Okay, we've seen that term before, you know, the word for pulley, trochlea. And um, lateral rectus, cranial nerve six, the nerve's name is abducens. Because that nerve abducts the eye. That nerve innervates a muscle that abducts the eye. So let's talk about the actions here. Starting with lateral rectus, the nerve says abduct the eye means this eyeball move away from the midline. That's abduction, okay, for this eyeball, if I look that way. Abducts eye. Another way to say it, you just look to the side, look laterally. Okay. <clears throat> Superior oblique, well, let me show you this figure to help us learn the actions of the muscle. Superior oblique, they call that the cheater muscle because it helps you look down to the side. Like, now, like this eyeball, not that eyeball. This eyeball, look down to the right, like copying off someone's paper. So we'll say, Look down and laterally. Inferior oblique, <clears throat> if you pull from below, it basically helps you look, um, look up. So we're just kind of looking straight up. Yeah, well, basically looking straight up. Inferior oblique. Sorry. Look up and laterally. That's the oblique one. Like for, this is a good example here. So superior oblique helps you look down and laterally. Inferior oblique helps you helps you look up and laterally. They call this one, uh, you know, the angel eyes. Like when I accuse my seven-year-old of lying. You can't look me in the eyes. Oh, I didn't do it. I'm innocent, you know. Angel eyes. Look up and laterally, down and laterally, those oblique ones. The inferior rectus just helps you look up. The medial rectus will help your well, will help control your eyeball inwards. So as lateral rectus abducts this eyeball, medial rectus uh, abducts this eyeball. Okay. Pull eye medially. <coughs> oh, I messed up. The inferior rectus helps you look down. And superior rectus helps you look up. Well, anyways, that's motor function. And um, not only do the eyeballs looking kind of help you, they, they color code the, the nerves down here. Green is abducens. Blue is trochlear. And yellow is uh, ocular motor for that figure. All right, so this is the somatic motor function for um, all of these muscles. Is there any questions? Well, the, the thing to know is all of these nerves, three, um, four, and six, they all exit superior orbital fissure. Superior 
orbital fissure. Turns out, uh, three, cranial nerve three has a parasympathetic function to the eyeball, so I'm gonna go over that. So I'm writing that this nerve, three, also has a visceral motor, motor function. We call that parasympathetic. Visceral motor or parasympathetic function. There's smooth muscle inside the eyeball. Um, I mean, I'm gonna give a full lecture on the eyeball probably uh, next time, and you'll do an eyeball dissection later this week. I think I have a schedule for Friday. Yeah, you see if the eyeballs are there. Yeah, it looks like they are. Okay. When you get your eyeball, I believe they're from cow, you're not going to get a smooth white ball like on Halloween eyeballs. It's got bone, fat, the extra ocular eye muscles are on it. It's not going to look like a round anything. You've got to cut it all off and to get it look like a smooth white ball. You've got to cut it open just like this. Okay. Well, I think that's Friday. Anyways, when you look inside, there's smooth muscle surrounding the lens that focuses the light rays on your retina so you can see clearly. And the smooth muscle is a, what's called the ciliary muscle. So this Ocular motor nerve innervates smooth muscle, ciliary muscle. It's not skeletal muscle, right? And um, what's easy to see from the picture, do you see how these suspensory ligaments all the way around, they're pulling on the lens. Now normally, when you try to look far away, like to the other side of the room, or when you're outside and you have to use your distance vision, the lens is kind of like pulled taut, okay? However, when you want to read something close to your face for close vision, what happens is this muscle contracts, and it contracts in a way that These suspensory ligaments go slack, and it allows the lens to bulge. So when the smooth muscle contracts, lens bulges, becomes more round. And that bends the light rays more to see something right in front of your face. We call that lens accommodation. Lens bulges for close vision, sometimes called <laughs> lens accommodation. Right, that, that's one function. Focuses your lens for reading, okay? Um, there's a picture of that. Sympathetic response is the lens is stretched out. Try to read something close, it contracts, the suspensory uh, ligaments go slack and the lens bulges a little bit for something that's a little bit closer. The goal is to focus it right on the back of your retina, the fovea. So this has to do with bending the light rays to the focal plane where the fovea is. 
and it has to do with the length of your eyeball. So uh, an appropriate length emetropic eye of normal vision it focuses to a point in the right plane. However, um, a myopic eye, the eyeball is too long and the light rays cross in front of it for blurry vision. So a uh, corrective lens, a concave lens, it bends the light rays in a way so that they will cross at the focal plane. So a concave lens corrects vision for a myopic eye. Eyeball is too long. The hyperoptic eye is too short. You're, you're farsighted. You, you can't see near. Okay. Whereas the myopic eye is nearsighted. You can't see far. So, eyeballs too short. You cross behind the focal plane. A convex lens will correct this. It'll bend the light rays in a way it will cross at the focal plane. Convex lens. Corrects vision for a hyper hyperopic eye. Let me see there. <clears throat> so one eyeball is too long, one eyeball is too short. So I'm nearsighted, my wife is farsighted, so my daughter doesn't need glasses. My eyeball's just right. Genetics worked out perfectly for us. All right, no, I'm not joking, that's, that's true. My daughter doesn't need glasses. Uh, smooth muscle of iris. Okay, so now let's talk about letting the light in your eyeball, that's your pupils. Okay. They can dilate or constrict to let more light in or keep more light out. So now you have this sphincter, well, let's just call it the smooth muscle of the iris. That color is right. <laughs> Turns out the parasympathetic function. Constricts pupil. Okay, it's shown on the left. <coughs> Sympathetic function dilates pupils. That's not cranial nerve three, right? Remember your sympathetics? They're from like T1 to L2, so it's probably some of the upper thoracic spinal nerves. You know, that's why in um, head trauma cases, that's a quick test for um, brainstem function. For example, you, know, you, you flash a pen light on your eye, it's supposed to constrict. But how the autonomics work is, if one is damaged, the other one takes over by default. So if um, someone comes in, their pupils are fixed and dilated, what does that mean? It's an indication that that nerve, as it comes off the brain stem, let me show you that. Go back up to this slide here. Cranial nerve three is this one right there. It's coming off the brain stem. Your sympathetics are way down there. They're not even in the brain stem. You're in the thoracic region. But if you have a head injury and you think there's brainstem function and there's say there's pressure building up 
inside the central nervous system. It could bend that nerve, make it not work. If it's not working, you cannot constrict the pupil, so it takes over. Like the sympathetic, and it's fixed and dilated. Okay. I mean, don't you watch those ER shows, and they roll the guy in, and pupil's fixed and dilated. I mean, do you ever stop to think what that means? Yeah, it means there could be trauma there. I mean, what if, like, one pupil's fixed and dilated, and the other one isn't? What does that mean? It means one of the nerves is messed up, and the other one isn't, because aren't they paired? Yeah, so that, those are the kind of things um, with a uh, quick assessment. So if both pu pupils can respond to a pen light and constrict, then at least you can say, well, cranial nerve 3 is working, so maybe the brain stem is okay. Uh, so, that, so that's why a constriction is, is a good thing to know. It's a quick assessment of cranial nerve 3. One last thing for cranial nerve 3, it also innervates uh, a muscle that lifts your eyelid to open your eyes. And the muscle's name is levator palpebrae superioris. Cranial nerve three. This is visceral motor function. Oh, I'm sorry. Not visceral somatic. Because you can lift your eyeballs at your command. I mean, you can open your eyes at your command. Somatic motor function. Innervates the levator, palpebrae, superioris. Now, this is a fancy way of saying your eyelids. Lift your eyelids. That's a lot of information for one cranial nerve. It does all of those things. Focuses lens, constricts your pupil, moves your eyeball in most directions, and lifts your eyelids. Okay. So I'm going to move on. I did three, four, and six. I'm going to go back and do five, the trigeminal nerve. The hard thing about five is you have to know the three main branches. It's a mixed nerve. Three, four, and six were strictly motor. This is as a motor and sensory function. Cranial nerve five. Trigeminal. It's a mixed nerve. It has sensory and motor functions. So let's kind of go through it. Um, my V1, 2, 3 kind of got off a little bit, but I'm pointing to the three places where each branch exits. So because it has three branches, the first branch, V1, its name is ophthalmic nerve. Like when you go to the ophthalmologist, so it helps your eyeball. Basically, this nerve exits superior orbital fissure. Maxillary You can either call it maxillary nerve or maxillary division It's a division of cranial nerve 5 Anyways, V2 exits foramen rotundum And then V3 is the mandibular nerve Foramen ovale. You study all of these exit points on the sphenoid bone. There's a picture showing you uh, the sensory function, and it's color coded to allow you to see the region there. So it looks like V1, it helps you feel your forehead basically. It's a sensory function. V2 helps you feel your upper jaw, and V3 helps you feel your lower jaw. <coughs> you know, 
of the skin of your face, basically. <coughs> so I want to show you um, here's V1. It's exiting the superior orbital fissure. If you follow it, to get all the way to the front of your face, it has to come out a hole in the front right there. Okay. Now we studied it before, and it was on the previous slide. So we'll go back to this one. It's the supraorbital nerve. It's exiting that um, supraorbital foramen or notch. That's one of the surface features on the skull. Okay. It's actually from V1. So the branch of V1 that helps you feel your forehead is supraorbital nerve. And the branch of V2 that helps you feel upper jaw is called infraorbital nerve. And it exits the foramen of, has the same name on maxillary. Nerve. There's a branch of V2. And then on the bottom there, it says mental nerve. Exits mental foramen. Helps you feel your lower jaw. So that's mental nerve. Exits the mental foramen. Think of it as a branch of V3 helps you feel your lower jaw. So once again, this um, is showing all three branches. Let's just follow the V1. It first exits here, superior, um, superior orbital fissure. When they get out to the front of the face, it's going to exit superorbital notch or foramen. <coughs> Here's V2 the maxillary division. It first exits through foramen rotundum. If you follow this branch here, infraorbital foramen is how it gets to the front of your face, the feel upper jaw. And they show the picture of the gingiva and the teeth because there are many branches that give you tooth sensations there. Okay. If you follow V3, okay, this is a little more complicated, so let me kind of map this out there. So, so far, this is all sensory function. Feel your face. V3, mandibular division. So, the trigeminal nerve, there's this big ganglion that gives out the three branches. V1, V2, and V3. But let's follow <coughs> V3. It's going to first exit foramenal valley. Uh, and it's going to kind of go down a ways after it leaves here goes through foramenal valley. It's going to go down towards the lower jaw. Now, on the inside of your lower jaw, um, I had you on your study on your study list a hole called the mandibular foramen. Mandibular foramen. So a branch of V3 after it exits foramen valley will go down and it'll enter the foramen, um, the mandibular foramen. And that branch as it runs through the jawbone is called the inferior alveolar nerve.
So this nerve here running in the jawbone, inferior alveolar nerve. You remember studying the alveolar process for the jaws? Well, they had the teeth sockets, right? Got your teeth. And there's little branches going up to the teeth. When you have a toothache, you feel it. The teeth have sensitivity. Uh, well, anyways, it's going to emerge out of the jawbone. Draw a little hole here. Well, anyways, that's what I was saying earlier. The um, name of the hole is its mental foreman in the front there. So that's kind of the course of that nerve. Starts off as V3, it enters the mandibular foramen, that branch call it inferior alveolar nerve, and then it exits and you just call the mental nerves when you're at the surface of your chin there. Right. That's the sensory function of this division. The motor function of this division is also shown here. There are branches of V3 that innervate muscles of mastication. Here's one here. It's called the masseter muscle. The two muscles of mastication, I want you to know that this muscle innervates are temporalis and masseter. So this will be somatic motor function. Masseter and temporalis, they help close jaw. Call them muscles of mastication. Mastication is basically the word for chewing and anatomy there. Okay, there's a blank figure you can study. So, uh, we're on to seven. Seven is basically the facial nerve. Facial nerve. muscles of the head, I, I won't ask you attachments, just idea and remember the nerve that innervates them. Facial nerve is also a mixed nerve. <coughs> it's going to exit, it's pointing to the internal acoustic meatus. This figure actually shows five and seven. Um, the neurophysiology, the, the fibers kind of get crossed. You don't have to know the details of that. Here, oh, here's seven. Okay, let's look at all the, the destinations there. Here's one. We say that this nerve salivates because it um, gives visceral motor function to two salivary glands, subbandibular sublingual. Do you think uh, salivation is a sensory or motor function? When you salivate. When a gland secretes something, that's considered visceral motor. Because right? you're commanding the gland to secrete. Think of it that way. However, the thing that makes you salivate you know, tasty food, that would be a sensory, right? You see the food, it makes you salivate. Okay, so that's seven. Know the names of those glands, submandibular, sublingual.
mandibular sublingual salivary glands. And um, this is another one, but it's innervated by another nerve. The other thing uh, they show you there is, well, they show you part of the tongue. It innervates the anterior two-thirds of taste, bugs, taste buds of tongue. Gustation, or tastes. You see the term gustation. That's the anatomy word for tastes. So it's called anterior two-thirds of tongue, the taste buds. Tasting is a sense function. Okay. I say it cries because up here is the lacrimal gland. Look where the gland is, it's on your eyeball, it produces tears. So basically, taste, cries, salivates. If you study the figure, it appears that Trailer 5 has that function. There's V2. You can actually say that, not being correct. I, I go with 7 because if you follow the nerve fibers all the way back, pregangliotics originate in the nucleus for 7. So we're going to go with 7 there. All right, so let's follow um, 7 there. It's going to go through this special passageway through uh, bone. It's going to emerge here. This is the temporal bone. That's actually your um, auditory ossicles for hearing. Anyways, that little hole is a stylomastoforming. Um, basically, when it emerges here, there are many branches of seven that will innervate all your face muscles. So I'm pointing to that location right there. So all of these branches, you don't have to know their names when they emerge right there through the style the style of mastoid form and they give off many branches to innervate what are called the muscles of facial expression. It's a somatic motor function. Alright, so what you gotta know, it first exits the internal acoustic meatus. A branch of it will emerge from stylomastoformin. A branch emerges through stylomastoid formin. Gives off many branches, don't got another name. So let's just say it innervates muscles of facial expression. Muscles of facial expression, well, be able to ID the muscle. I'm going to go through them. And know the expression, okay? Basically, these muscles can convey expression because they insert onto skin. And when you move the skin of your face, it looks like you're expressing some kind of emotion. That's what you got to know, basically. So, but for example, I'm not going to list all the muscles on the board. You are responsible for them. I'm just going to say study the slides. It's all here. Occipital frontalis, when that muscle contracts, kind of wrinkles your brow, you look surprised. Okay. Orbicularis oculi, a circular muscle. So when it contracts, it kind of makes you wink. Ah, nasalis flares your nostrils. Maybe you appear a little upset or angry, right? Mm -hmm. Flare your nostrils. Um, Levator labi superiores. 
So the word means, levator means lift. Lay-by refers to lift. So it kind of lifts your upper lip there, like when you snarl, I guess. Zygomaticus, major and minor. Minors are superior. There's the minor, there's the major. Basically, it gets the angle of your mouth there. So if you pull one corner, I guess you look like you're, like you're growling or something. Here is depressor anguli oris. It originates there, inserts on the corner of your uh, lips there. So basically, it looks like you're frowning. Uh, levator anguli oris, this one up here. I'll just smile. This is a buccinator. Okay, buccinator, it's kind of deep inside there. They call this the musician's muscle. I say here, you know, presses cheeks against molar teeth to keep food there, expels air from the oral cavity as when playing a wind instrument. You know, like when you blow, they call it the embouchure. Whether you play trumpet or clarinet, a woodwind or a brass wind, you have to keep the shape of your mouth consistent to blow notes. So that's why it's called um, the musician's muscle. Okay. Um, orbicularis oris, not to be confused with orbicularis oculi. So this helps you pucker, as in whistling. Mentalis elevates and protrudes the lower lip, as in pouting. Okay, anyways. I think that's kind of fun, muscles of facial expression. Um, I gave you a figure to study for that. They're all cradle, a branch of cradle nerve 7 and just basically know the, um, be able to ID and know the expression that's conveyed. Eight, the stimulus cochlear. Exits um, internal acoustic meatus. I have a whole lecture on uh, the inner ear structure. Basically, what you see there, there's a branch that's for um, hearing, but also balance and equilibrium for the vestibular part. So the cochlear part is for hearing. The vestibular part is balance equilibrium. Just note that for now and more about later. Wednesday and Friday, I'll get to the ear. Move on to like nine. Well, it turns out nine, ten, and eleven all exit the jugular foramen. Cranial nerve nine, ten, eleven all exit jugular foramen. We'll do nine first in terms of its function. I, I had it listed there. So nine, the name of nine is glossal pharyngeal, referring to the tongue and the throat. Glossal is tongue, pharyngeal is your throat. So I say it tastes. <coughs> Again, taste is sensory function. It gets, um, it innervates the taste buds from posterior one-third of your tongue. <coughs> the facial nerve gets the anterior two-thirds, this kind of gets the rest. Posterior one-third tongue. The um, next thing is salivates. That is a motor function, a visceral motor. 
The name of the gland is the parotid salivary gland. I have a picture of it on the, on the right. It's a big gland. You ever take a first bite of food and you feel that tingling sensation on the side of your mouth there? That's basically this nerve being stimulated. The duct will pierce buccinator and it will secrete by your back molar of your upper jaw. Okay. Yeah, let's just say it salivates parotid gland. To know that the duct is very noticeable. All, all glands have ducts, in, but that one is noticeable enough. I maybe I'll have you identify it. Swallows. It innervates the uh, pharyngeal muscles that help you swallow. That's a motor function. And also, um, it's, a, it's a sensory information. There's something called the carotid sinus next to the carotid artery, and it's sending uh, pressure, pressure, blood pressure, and blood gas information. So we call it a pressure chemosensor. It's located in the carotid sinus. So it's a pressure chemo detector or sensor. There's a branch of nine that goes to the carotid sinus. Okay, so that's all the, the function of nine. It's a mixed nerve. I wanted to show you a picture of the taste bud at least. Uh, this is deep inside the tongue. You can see the histology on the bottom and the artwork on the top. That kind of matches it. When you chew your food and you work it deep in your tongue, the food molecules get here triggering the sense of taste. So if you um, look at the tongue, there's anterior, anterior two-thirds facial, posterior one-third glossopharyngeal, and the epiglottis even conveys some sense of taste. That's 10. I'm going to do that next. Okay. But basically, it's 7 and 9 are most of the taste buds. Okay, 10 is like the longest nerve Vegas. So don't think Las Vegas. It's not spelled like that, is it? Students always want to spell it like that. Um, Vegas is vagabond. Goes everywhere. Okay. That's a lot of how it's not its name. So cranial nerve uh, 10, Vegas. It's just the headache. It's, it's too much. I'll just say it gets viscera. All the organs of your chest and basically thoracic and abdominal cavities get that viscera. one function of what it actually affects. For example, um, the heart was in the chest, and basically the vagus nerve helps slow the heart rate down. Okay, that's what's shown there. So I'll just say, just keep your one function there. Decrease heart rate. The vagus nerve is your major visceral efferent nerve. Uh, 11, uh, spinal accessory nerve. Show this picture there. <coughs> oh, it decreases heart rate. Yes. The spinal accessory nerve has access to spinal nerves, hence the name. It's considered a cranial nerve. 
but it has access to cervical spinal nerves. So what the picture shows you is here are some cervical spinal nerves there. The nerve actually enters the foramen magnum, then exits uh, the jugular foramen. So it first enters, then exits. So here's jugular foramen. And this nerve, which is a motor nerve, is going to get little roots from your cervical spinal nerves. It's going to go up. So it's first going to enter the skull through your um, jugular foramen. It's going to go into the skull. Then it's going to go out of the skull through the jugular. Oh, God, my gosh, I'm so messing up today. This is jugular foramen. This course has to end. I keep messing up. Apologize. This is foramen magnum. So it enters foramen magnum. So I'll put enters. It exits jugular foramen. There, now I got it straight. And what the picture shows you it moves neck and shoulder because it helps innervate the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. Okay, that's what's shown on the bottom there. SCM for short, sternocleidomastoid helps move neck, shoulders, trapezius. So basically, that's a, a motor nerve. Cranial nerve 12, hypoglossal nerve, the word means below the tongue. It exits hypoglossal canal on the occipital bone. Well, I have a picture of the tongue muscles. You don't have to know the names of the tongue muscles. But it means under the tongue. So all these muscles are kind of back here, posterior to and inferior to the tongue. So it's not taste. It's, it's moving the tongue. That's a motor function. So for its function, I'll just say move tongue. Let me keep that simple there. Well, I got to the 12th nerve, so you know I'm done with the cranial nerves. I'll stop there, and uh, when we pick it up on Wednesday, I'll teach the eye, okay? Well, we're going to take a break, and so before you um, skedaddle for break, I want to explain to you lab, because when you come back from break, I want you to form groups of about three to four-ish. Depending on brain availability. Did anyone do the homework yet? Anyone? Or something? You started it? Okay, most of you started it. Did anyone actually see the sheet brain dissection part of the homework? Anybody? Maybe a few people. Well, that, that's going to help you today. I mean, if you did it, don't worry about it. I'm not, I didn't require you to do that prior. The labs are always fun. You just get the brain in your hand. It's going to have the dura matter on it, a bunch of other stuff. And when you dissect, there's pictures in the protocol. The, the easiest thing I can do when you dissect is um, just make your brain look like the picture. That's the easiest instruction I can give. And once you get it um, looking reasonably like your picture, try to identify the structures. Okay? And um, the structures are listed on the third page. There's just 12 things. When you dissect the brain, you're basically removing all the tissue that kind of gets in the way of you seeing the brain. ID the 12 structures. Now to help you identify the 12 structures, the brains are just big enough to where if you get a set of dissection pins, they're over there. 
Use pins to poke them. And I even put out um, some lab tape and markers so you can actually just label the pin. And when you get all 12 in your brain, you can just call me and I'll, and I'll check you off and it'll be easy to see if you get all 12 of them correct. If any are incorrect, well, I'll just kind of have you do those over. But try to be right the first time. Okay. Um, that's it. I'll tell you how to dispose of things and this and that. And, well, you're going to need gloves and goggles. So hopefully um, you guys are ready for that. I did print out the printer for you, but um, I did print out this for you. I didn't print out enough for everybody, but I think there should be enough to go around. What I need from you when you're done, if I check your 12 structures and it's all good, I just need like this little half sheet with all your names on it and I'll initial that your dissection was good enough and then you're free to clean up and go. But first, let's take a break and come back, we'll write into lab. So come back at about 9.20. And go right into lab when you come back. Spinal accessory. Cranial accessory, I don't use that. Uh, 